Welcome to the Reinventors Roundtable and this week's Roundtable on Reinventing Money and Politics. Now, since we launched this series uh, last winter, uh, we've been basically every week gathering innovators from all over the country and all over the world to really focus on reinventing of all kinds of different fields. How do we move our 20th century systems into the 21st century? How do we really redesign these things to fit a much more all digital, much more global, and hopefully more sustainable kind of system? How do we take on these next big challenges with, with the next generation of big ideas? And almost all these efforts would be accelerated by uh, a government, a national government's foresight, one that operates uh, with real strategic uh, vision, one that actually is investing in the future and, and looking, uh, thinking about the long term. Now, uh, what we know in Washington is, in fact, Washington is, is pretty much paralyzed, and in many respects, uh, it's perpetuating the status quo. And one of the main reasons for that is, is the incredible impact of big money in politics. Uh, the folks, uh, the companies, the industries, the, the wealthy folks that actually have a big stake in perpetuating the status quo, in fact, have an inordinate influence on our electoral process. Now, no one's really seen this uh, as clearly as uh, Larry Lessig, who's going to be anchoring this uh, week's roundtable. He's, he's long seen that really one of the first big problems we've got to solve is figuring out this money and politics problem. We have to figure out that, in other words, to get the kind of uh, government we need, responsive government, far-sighted government, government we need to actually respond to these long-term and big, big challenges we all face. Now, most of us, or many people know Larry. If you don't know Larry, um, he's actually a professor at uh, the uh, law professor at, at Harvard Law School. He used to be at Stanford Law School. But, but really, the folks in the kind of tech world really got to know him really deeply uh, in the 90s when he took on, essentially reinvented, helped reinvent intellectual property law to, to fit into the new digital age. But by about 2007, he shifted his focus from that after a lot of success, and that, that ball being moved quite substantially into this money and politics space. And for the last six years, he's been focused on this. He's essentially started a, another organization called Root Strikers, which, as the name implies, is getting at this root problem. And he's written a bunch of books, but his most recent book is um, basically Republic Lost, How Money Corrupts Congress and a Plan of What to Do About It. Now, that he's, we're not going to talk about that plan here. Um, in fact, uh, he thinks he and others have a lot of ideas of how to solve that. What he is bringing, he's actually using this round table the way we've re always envisioned it to be used. He's actually pulled together, he's putting on a table a problem he doesn't know how to solve. And in short, we'll talk to him, but essentially it's how do we build the public pressure needed to actually force that kind of systemic change on Washington. And for that, he's brought together an incredible, really an extraordinary group of folks uh, who actually know a lot about stealing efforts on the internet, and particularly also political efforts on the internet. And he's really genuinely asked them to come to the table to help him think this through. Now, before before we basically go to Larry and get this teed up, uh, let's go around the round table and uh, everyone will introduce themselves and tell a little bit about what they bring to the table. And I think actually, Tim, you've been on this, I think your third one here, so why don't you tee off and, uh, and kind of set, set that off in general. All right. Um, well, I, I think that the main thing that I bring to the table is that I've been involved in a number of the big ideas. Uh, that have caught on. And I, I think, you know, when we think about movements, we often think about specific agendas. And what I have found uh, is that the most powerful big ideas you know, are, are really ones that form a big tent that a lot of people can get behind. Uh, Jim Barksdale, in the early days of, uh, uh, you know, the popularization of the web, uh, you know, had this great line. He said, "Find a parade and then get in front of it." And I think you know, when I've worked on things like uh, open source software or the maker movement uh, or uh, open government, a lot of what I've tried to do is find all the people who have some part of the parade. And I do think that that's what we're trying to do here. There are a lot of people who have an interest in solving this problem, and we don't want to target it just to one group. We want to figure out uh, how, um, uh, you know, to get more people involved, uh, to get more people to care. So, I'm, you know, I'm a tech publisher and conference promoter, but I'm really a big idea promoter. And so that's kind of what I bring to the table here. Great. Thanks, uh, thanks Tim. Um, how about Ben? Why don't you just get, introduce yourself and what you bring to the table in this short intro. Uh, thanks a lot. Excited to be here. Uh, so Ben Rattray, founder and CEO of Change.org. But uh, 45 million users around the world starting citizen movements. And I think what we're most excited about now is this transition from historically impersonal, partisan, and centralized campaigns to very personal, 
apolitical distributed campaigns that ironically have greater capacity to influence politics than the former. Great to have you here. June, do you want to jump in and tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure, just unmuting. Uh, yeah, so I'm June Cohen. I, um, I'm with TED. I launched TED Talks and TED.com, as well as our open translation project. Um, TED Talks have now been watched around a billion and a half times around the world, and we have around 10,000 people involved in our translation project. And so to answer your question of what I bring to the table, I can help you think, help, you know, help us kind of think through how ideas spread, of course, especially digitally. Also, how, um, what are some of the factors that help um, kind of open participatory communities take off? And uh, also perhaps think a little bit about how you uh, create a community that remains nonpartisan, which is a good, tricky question to address. Terrific. All right, how about Marcos? Jump in and give us a little bit about your background. Yeah, I guess I'm the uh, partisan in this bunch. I run Daily Coast, um, the founder of that. I also co-founded the, the decidedly nonpartisan Vox Media, uh, which is uh, SB Nation, The Verge, uh, Polygon. Uh, but uh, on, on the political front, Daily Coast is my home base. And uh, we have been fighting for, for years now to combat the effect of big money in politics. The Daily Coast community uh, over the last three cycles has raised over $10 million in small dollar donations, average donation in $30 range, and, and uh, believe very strongly in the aggregating that small dollar as a way to, to try to combat the effect of, of big dollar politics. Fantastic. Um, Brad, you want to jump in? Sure. Um, I'm Brad Burnham, and uh, I'm one of the founding partners of Union Square Ventures in New York. Uh, what I bring to the table, I guess, is that we have been investing in the applications layer of the web for the past uh, almost 10 years now, and we've tried to identify companies that are going to be fundamentally disruptive in important markets, and in doing so, we found that there are incumbents in those markets who actually like the market structure the way it is, and they have been fairly effective in the last couple of years in using their relationship with uh, the incumbent politicians to sort of keep the market structure the way it is. And I think, so my interest in the problem is trying to make sure that money in politics doesn't actually ultimately impede the freedom to innovate because it's those innovative services that really benefit consumers and actually do it in a way that consume a lot less uh, of our, our shared social resources. And so I think it's the right thing to do and I think it's the, it's, become more difficult to do, and I think Larry has put his finger on the root of the problem. Fantastic. Uh, Anna, do you want to jump in? Sure. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the conversation as well. It's a great group. Um, so I'm Anna Galland. I'm the executive director of MoveOn.org Civic Action. Um, and what I bring to the table here, I think, is First of all, our 8 million members in the U.S. who have added their names to petitions and marched in the streets and given hundreds of millions of dollars to outsider progressive candidates over many years, um, as well as now um, a passion for sort of uh, disruptive online organizing. So right now we're leaning into what we've been calling our million leaders strategy, um, which is um, really about enabling our members to run their own campaigns with a kind of common framework. Um, you know, the problems that we face are so big that we need both real ownership by grassroots citizens and organizations around the country and kind of unifying progressive values, an umbrella that helps to bring together all these distributed efforts. Um, so I'm really looking forward to the conversation. I would say what we bring to the table is an expertise in um, progressive organizing, nonpartisan but grounded strongly in um, uh, progressive values and a willingness and indeed a belief that we have to engage with the explicitly political process at different points in order to really uh, make the change that we so desperately need. Terrific. Uh, and Bram, round it out with a little bit about yourself. You're muted. You got a mute on the upper right there. Oop. You're still, Bram, you're still muted there. Up. Can you get the upper right hand uh, red mic there? Can anyone hear him? I'll point out that Bram is the technologist among us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, might be a mic setting. We'll come back to Bram in a minute here. Um, why don't we just, uh, oop. Okay, you're unmuted, Bram. No, there might be a mic check. You might want to check on that, but we'll, uh, we'll cycle back to you. 
Um, the other thing is, is fantastic, as everyone is on this uh, roundtable, there's a lot of folks watching this um, who have other great ideas and great questions. You can watch it on our website at um, uh, reinventors.net, and in fact, ask questions, add comments. You can do it on the G Plus environment, um, in which uh, the invent on the reinventors page there, the event there. You can also do use Twitter, ask questions in uh, with the hashtag reinventors. We do watch those. We do cycle them in if they're relevant, and the best of them we actually package in our final kind of package at the end. So really highly encourage you to do that. Um, anyhow, uh, we'll maybe try one last time with Bram. Do you want to try one more? Um, uh, yeah, can there. you hear me now? There we go. Okay, you're, you're good. Into. Yeah, I'm Bram Cohen. Uh, I'm the creator of BitTorrent. Uh, I know a lot about uh, technology and how to make things accessible to, how to make technology accessible to the general public. Fantastic. It's great to have you here. Well, Larry, um, let's put it back to you. Set the table with um, your kind of frame of the, not just the big problem, but also the problem at hand here, and uh, then we'll roll into the discussion. Um, but go ahead, Larry. Give us your, uh, your analysis here. Great. So first, Peter, thank you for putting this together, and thanks to this extraordinary group for gathering to have this conversation. As we set it up, um, uh, the conversation, of course, is about what people call money in politics, what I call the corruption of this government. Um, but we're going to focus the conversation about the actual technical or techniques that we might adopt to make this a successful movement. But let me set up the problem a little bit so we're all on the same page. As I think about the problem, the problem is not that money is in politics. There's no way to avoid a politics with money in it. The problem is the way that we fund campaigns and the effect that has on the politics that our government produces. And what, if you look at the last 30 years, I think you can see the way in which we've evolved a form of funding campaigns that has made our government incredibly unstable. Because the members of Congress, and that's the target audience that I'm worried about, the members of Congress have been forced into a pattern of life where they spend an extraordinary amount of time, you know, the estimates are from 30 to 70 percent of their time, raising money from an extraordinarily tiny slice of the American public. Um, I just recently gave a TED talk, which I was excited to see just hit more than a million views. Um, in that TED talk, I framed this around uh, uh, what I called Lesterland. But the point of Lesterland was to get, give people an intuition about just how few funders there are, relevant funders in our political system. Um, it turns out there's less than about 150,000 relevant funders of political campaigns, or at least the mainstream political campaigns, which means that less than 0.05% of America is involved in the business of being the relevant funders of political campaigns. Now, what that means is, a very, very tiny slice of America effectively has the power to veto or to block any important change uh, because a very, very tiny slice of this class of relevant funders has the capacity to signal their unhappiness with the progressive or uh, even conservative change and then block members of Congress from adopting it. So whether that's climate change legislation or financial reform or true reform of health care or a change in the way the tax system functions or addressing the national debt. doesn't matter what the issue is. The point is we've evolved a system that gives these funders an extraordinary capacity to veto reform. Now, the American government was set up with its system of checks and balances to make change difficult. The idea of the framers was to make it so that if there was going to be fundamental change, it really had to earn the support of a broad swath of the American public. But by layering on top of their system this way of funding campaigns, what we've done is take maybe a good idea, maybe not a good idea, but we've taken their idea and we've made it essentially a government that cannot function. This government will not address in a sensible way any of the important issues that people care about whether it's the issues that I was fighting about in the internet space and copyright reform to the issues I think many people think are fundamental, whether it's climate change or our debt problem. All of these issues are basically off the table from serious effective reform because of the way we fund campaigns. That's the problem. In my view, there's a pretty obvious way to solve that problem. Um, and, and, and I don't actually think that this first step of solving the problem actually requires amending the Constitution. The way to solve that problem, if the problem is 
we fund campaigns by having candidates uh, spend an extraordinary amount of time raising money from a tiny slice of America. The solution to that problem is to reduce the amount of time they're spending raising money, but most importantly, broaden out the range of Americans from whom they're raising that money. So that when they feel themselves dependent upon their funders, it turns out the funders are the people. The funders are us. It's the same people who elect them. So that there's no systematic distortion in favor of this tiny, tiny fraction of the 1%. And there are many proposals out there for doing that. There's proposals called the American Anti-Corruption Act that would create essentially a $100 voucher for every voter to use to fund their campaigns. There's something like the Fair Elections Now Act uh, or the Grassroots Democracy Act which are ways to match small dollar contributions. All of those solutions are out there. They're possible. They're all constitutional. The question is how we create the political force to make them essential and uh, certain to be part of our future. And that's what this conversation is supposed to be um, the beginning of. Now, you know, pundits in our political system like to frame the problems of American politics as, as a division between the left side and the right side. But I think if the internet has taught us anything, it is that the most interesting division in American politics is actually between the inside and the outside. It's that division that woke Washington up to the fact that there was actually power in the outside, which you know, effectively stopped the SOPA-PIPA legislation, um, which astonished insiders inside of Washington. And that was just the beginning of a demonstration of the power that I think really Move On launched more than a decade ago when they rallied millions of people to get Congress to stop focusing on the silly question of whether a president had lied about having, uh, having sex with, uh, with uh, uh, one of his uh, staff. So this has been an idea for, about the internet for a long time. It's been increasingly successfully deployed. And the puzzle, the challenge that I'd like to have this conversation about is how can we learn from the lessons that we've seen over the last 15 years of internet success, what can we learn from those lessons and apply to this particular problem? And in my view, a solution has a, has a number of important characteristics. One, um, um, one is that it feels nonpartisan. Now, that doesn't mean that we've got to all believe that we all believe the same thing. It's not some major, you know, some big kumbaya moment where we think, geez, we all happen to have the same views. We don't. There's real difference between liberals and conservatives and libertarians. We have different political values, and we should respect those differences, even if we disagree with the people we respect. Um, so by, by, by nonpartisan or cross-partisan, what I mean is people have the recognition that despite the differences they might have on fundamental issues, there's a more fundamental problem that they need to address, and that is to get a democracy or a, a government that actually works. So the first characteristic is that it feels and, and appears and is genuinely cross-partisan. Um, and, and because it's cross-partisan, people from every perspective can begin to recognize why the issue they care about um, needs this solution if they're going to get their issue, take, issue taken care of. I think people on the left see this very directly. You know, if we care about climate change legislation, we see the way oil companies and coal companies make it practically impossible to imagine getting such legislation or sensible legislation without this change. But I think increasingly people on the right are, may, are, are having the same recognition. You know, if you are on the right and you want a smaller government, uh, and you begin to recognize that in fact a bigger government makes it easier for congressmen to extort the money they need out of the businesses they regulate, you begin to see the way in which the system is tilted against you uh, in your objective to have a, as a principled way the policy of shrinking the size of government. So cross-partisan means everybody sees why fixing this issue helps them get to the issue they care about more easily. The second characteristic I think is essential for this feeling like a successful movement. Um, is that it, it genuinely feels like it's, it's not professionals. It's not the political professionals, um, by which I mean you know, the people inside of Washington, the, the senators, the congressmen, the congressmen wannabes, the people whose careers hang on the existing system um, and the way the existing system works. Um, now, that's not because I don't respect them. I have enormous respect for politicians and public servants. Um, 
uh, and I think that they do, uh, you know, they have really a miserable life, and I guess I just want to make their life better by making it possible for them to have the kind of job that I think they imagine they would get into. But I think people on the outside need to recognize how we on the outside need to step up and do something about this. Um, because if we don't, if we don't take this up and, and engage with it in the way that, you know, organizations have demonstrated people have the passion to do, such as, you know, moveonandchange.org have, have shown this really powerfully. If we don't do that, then, then the insiders will win. They, they will control it and they will win. And they will win by preserving the existing system, which turns out to be so enormously profitable for the lobbyists the businesses that depend upon the lobbyists, and ultimately for the politicians themselves. So these two characteristics, that it's genuinely cross-partisan and it feels like genuinely an outsider movement, are the essential features to a, a solution. And I guess the question that I throw out to the group or that we can begin the conversation about is, what are the elements that get us to the place that uh, we might actually see the, that kind of movement develop? So again, thank you to Peter and thank you to everybody else on this chat. Um, um, uh, but I'm eager now to hear how we might do something about it. Terrific. Uh, thanks, Larry. Um, well, I'm just going to start it going. I'm just going to actually go, Tim, why don't you take a swing? And how would you start to wrap your head around this? But then also, uh, let's start to, if people want uh, to jump in, jump in here, too. Oop, you're muted, Tim. you got to basically come up. Yeah, one of the things that I have uh, learned over the years is that these things, first of all, they start small and then they grow big fairly quickly. You know, it feels like nothing is happening and then all of a sudden everything is happening. When we were back there in the early 90s working on the commercialization of the Internet, you know, people were just like, what are you talking about? You know, what are you smoking? And then, you know, within a few years it really took off. Um, you know, there was this sort of ragtag group of, um, you know, people who were, you know, in it for a wide variety of reasons. And then the commercial interest got in. And I think there's a really important point there. Uh, you know, this movement of getting money out of politics uh, doesn't mean that we, you know, it's like this is this, uh, you know, sort of commie thing where we don't want money. You know, it's really where does the money uh, go and I, I think if if we can actually find how this better for the economy, it's better for um, you know companies, it's better for the market uh, for this system not to be so distortive. I think that will actually become a fairly powerful set of incentives. Uh, I do think that there's some uh, important role for understanding that this isn't just an idealistic political movement. It's it's actually a different kind of economy that we want. You know, that was again part of what happened when we were doing our activism about open source software. The original arguments for free software were purely moral arguments. And then it became a discussion of how actually, no, this was a better software development methodology uh, that would actually allow uh, companies to succeed in new ways. And in fact, we saw that and, and open source software really got traction uh, when it became clear that it was actually not antithetical to the world as we knew it, but a, a new way for people to do business. And so we saw companies like Amazon and Google building on top of open source software as opposed to, well, we're just going to tear down Microsoft. And I think in a similar way, we need to say, how would our economy be better? And how would more people be winners in a world where uh, we didn't have such a narrow set of people uh, who are feeding at the trough. Because I think that is, is part of the secret. It's not just about the fact that Congress needs money to be reelected, but it's the fact that the people in Congress uh, control so much of where the government uh, spending goes. And of course, it's not just people in Congress, although that's uh, Larry's focus. It's all the way through down into policy, from policy all the way down into implementation in the agencies uh, and into procurement of, of services by the government that you see vast, uh, you know, uh, financial incentives for particular policies. And the people who are going to profit from those policies uh, will, of course, push for them. So I guess my point is we have to actually highlight uh, new ways uh, for companies to succeed. Um, and, and I think it's not just about politics. It's, it's about 
uh, sort of identifying really a new economy that's less distorted by this uh, corrupt government private sector you know unholy marriage uh, where you know it makes a whole lot of sense to invest in regulatory capture uh, to invest in uh, you know buying a government intervention on your behalf Thanks. Hey, uh, Ben, do you want to jump to Ben and then Marcos want to jump in? Go ahead. Yeah, thanks a lot, Peter. So I wanted to comment uh, on the broad general frame of things, not the issue itself, which I think we all agree there is very articulately outlined, not just today, but many times in the past, but the way to approach the problem, in particular, not just the nonpartisan nature, but the sort of outsider perspective. And I want to note how iconoclastic that is, unfortunately, right now in the sort of the nonprofit advocacy complex. The natural reaction, the reflexive initial impulse for most people in most campaigns like this is let's build this massive national movement on a single campaign, centralize everything, how do we get a million people in petition, and it fails to recognize that the history of social movements are largely not just started from grassroots because it sounds good, because the way of distributed power by changing things from the ground up, many, many individual actions in local contexts has greater capacity to build longer term movements that ironically have bigger centralized impact in the future. So I just wanted to know, I just think that's so important. It's not just, it sounds good, it's not that it's nice if citizens own it, although there are benefits to that. But the reality is the difference between a single campaign that is difficult to achieve all sort of at a single point in time and thousands of local campaigns that are eminently achievable on a daily basis builds a kind of momentum, the kind of movement that I think is the powerful outside force that we need. And we see this at change all the time, every single issue, every petition that started at a national level when we look at it, we're, this has an infinitesimal chance of victory relative to the local campaigns on similar issues that are started at massive scale. And I just think that's the one most exciting thing to talk about here is how do you end up sort of running these distributed movements that win incremental steps toward a larger goal over time? And how do you do that, most importantly, in both the distributed way that recognizes the power of people that are normal everyday citizens, but also some amount of organizational oversight to aggregate them in an effective manner. And that's actually not an easy balance uh, to make, and we've seen this happen over the past year on the site, which I'm happy to comment on, but that dynamic is going to be really important. Focused on distributed organizing with some amount of sort of lightweight organization as well. Yeah, this is Larry again. I, I, I completely agree with that. There's one historical precedent that we should keep in mind here, which is the progressive movement. Now, from our perspective, we're likely to think of the progressive movement as, you know, some big organization of a bunch of leftists. Um, but the progressive movement was made up of lots of different organizations, lots of different small groups that had their own issue. You know, some of them are repulsive issues, like people who wanted to force sterilization onto uh, the mentally uh, handicapped. Some of them are very important issues, like getting women the right to vote. Um, some of them were issues that we, you know, again, like prohibition, don't have a lot of uh, patience for. But the point is, these were lots of different organizations on the left and the right, uh, Republican progressive organizations as well as Democratic progressive organizations. They had no choice but to organize in this small grassroots way, because there was no broadcasting, there was no internet, there was nothing to kind of bring everybody into a single organization. But I think the political insight that's so important is because they were diverse, because there was no central structure, it wasn't trivially easy for the enemy to destroy them because there was nothing to attack. There was no, you know, you couldn't spin it as a lefty organization or a righty organization. Um, it was just many different organizations all pushing to recognize that the democracy of that era had been corrupted in a fundamental way and it had to change. Now, their corruption was different from ours, and I don't think we're exactly the same problem that they faced, but I completely agree. It's got to be this kind of uh, diverse, many-person type of movement, all of us nudging in the, in the same direction. Marcos, you wanted to jump in. Why don't you jump in? That's great. Yeah. I, I, there's sort of this sense I, I'm getting, at least early on, and maybe I'm mistaken, but this notion that we have to create this movement, that it has to come from somewhere. And, and really, it's already begun, and it, 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 it's had uh, several years, several cycles, in fact, uh, of ramping up. I mean, the only reason Barack Obama was able to uh, overcome Hillary Clinton's establishment machine in 2008 was because of a massive small dollar, uh, small uh, people mobilization. So, uh, yes, here on this chat list, I mean, from Move On, uh, Change.org, Daily Coast, my own Daily Coast, I mean, our business models are now predicated on helping campaigns and organizations build their email lists, not, not Move On, but Change and, and Daily Coast. Uh, because there is probably no more valuable commodity right now aside from an actual dollar bill than an email address from somebody 
that can provide that five, ten, fifteen dollar donation further down the road. So uh, we're building this already. Um, so the question then does become: Can we create the sort of mass and the scale that can overcome the big money from from big pharma or big energy or or any of the big money uh, nefarious interests? And, and that's sort of the big pitch, uh, big question. But the notion of a small dollar, small per, uh, individual revolution, I think, is already in in root. It's happening, uh, and it's just a question of encouraging it, growing it, and becoming more influential in the process. Because uh, I mean, just today there was a hilarious story in roll call. I mean, I, I couldn't believe it. Uh, the DCCC, the, the House Democratic Committee, has been very aggressive in, in collecting, building their email list, which has led to very successful small dollar donations to the point where they're at, regularly out raising the Republican counterpart in the House. So there's an article on Roll Call this morning about the, the guy, uh, the congressman who's in charge of the House Committee saying, we know some people in Silicon Valley and they're going to help us match and overcome the Republican, as though this is some magical one-person thing, right? It's like the girlfriend that lives in Canada. Uh, you don't know her because she lives in Canada, but she really does exist. No one person, no one technologist, no one individual in Silicon Valley can build that. Obviously, it has to be a mass movement, but Repu Democrats are actually be, uh, building this and becoming very successful at it. Republicans are playing catch-up, and the realization now is Anybody who has any interest in any major office, they need to build that small dollar base. And I think that's good for our democracy moving forward. Yeah, it's, I completely agree with that. Um, except, you know, I guess part of the frustration out of the last couple cycles of success there is that, you know, small dollar money then got sold out to big dollar uh, uh, contribu contributors, right? So the, I guess if there's a new movement here, it's not new in the sense that people have, not, have been. Uh, have not been thinking about changing the way campaigns have been funded forever. You know, Common Cause was born with that as its common purpose. Uh, it's, it's instead to say, we need to, a small dollar movement to change the rules for funding campaigns so that it's small dollars that matters all the way down, right? So we'll, of course, even if you don't change the rules, we'll be fighting for small dollar contributions mattering. But my fear is they're never, they're never going to matter enough. Um, to, to a take on the critical issues where um, I think, you know, both, both Brad and, um, uh, well, you know, when Brad was talking about the, the problem of innovators being uh, frozen out by the incumbents, that dynamic is what economists have been predicting since they've been thinking about this in Adam Smith. It's that the incumbents will always have the incentive, and now we've given them the tools with the way we fund campaigns to use the government to protect themselves from new innovators. So small dollar contributions have worked. You've demonstrated, all of you on this call, about how we can make that happen. But we need to take the next step, which is get this so that we change the rules so that these are the ones that really matter. Anna, do you want to jump in? And then, and then, and then Tim's going to go. We'll go to Tim after that. Sure. I mean, this is, um, I just wanted to sort of share one thing that I picture in this discussion is not just the kind of problems that we have in D.C. Um, with the sort of money chase and the way that Larry described it, but um, there was a, a story that a member told me at one point about a town selectman's meeting in, in Raymond, Maine, which is not even you know, a large place in Maine, um, where they were making a decision about a, a pipeline, I think, that was going to be passing through the town. And the number of oil company lobbyists at the town selectmen's meeting outnumbered the number of town selectmen in this small town as they were making this key decision. So this is really, I think, um, the sort of issue of how money and then the people that it sort of backs up and unleashes on the political process, it's not just the money, it's the staff, it's the um, TV ads, it's the all the things that sort of flow from having money in politics, um, that it's not just in DC, it's all around the country that this is a problem. And I think that leads to an opening. Um, and I think this gets to what Marcos was saying, that the, you know, the sort of um, future of organizing around money and politics, as well as I think all the other very pressing problems that we face, some of which are directly connected to money and politics and some of which operate on their own, um, is for us to figure out how we fundamentally empower individuals and activists and the grassroots organizations, because it's not just individuals, it's small organizations that have been organizing for years and, and uh, doing incredible work around the country, how to sort of fundamentally empower them to bubble up 
thoughtful, fun, creative, potentially breakout emergent tactics, and then crucially figuring out how to scale them. So how do you connect you know, our members in Maine who just successfully passed a constitutional amendment um, against Citizens United? They know a lot. How do we actually get them sharing with our members in New York State who just fell short on a public financing law? Um, and you know, how do we essentially use what the internet and other technologies can do best, which is to facilitate organizing um, which is distributed and emergent and rapidly cross-pollinating and replicating the best stuff, but connecting it, again, connecting it, was, as I think Marcos put it well, how do you sort of connect it with a light layer of, of essentially broader national strategy so that it's not just a thousand points of light that end up then sort of being something nice to look at but die away, um, but something that's transformative. Tim, go for it. Yeah, uh, I wanted to say I'm a little bothered that we're having this conversation uh, in a way that sort of accepts the idea that, you know, well, it'll be better if we just move from giving a few, few people giving large amounts of money to lots of people giving small amounts of money. It still accepts the framing that we're buying our legislators rather than the, that they're actually making decisions for the public good. And I, the reason why I think it goes much deeper than, uh, you know, what we spend on campaigns is precisely w um, what uh, Anna just mentioned, the number of lobbyists. Lobbyists are there because they actually have an economic interest in the outcome. And that's not going to go away. And, you know, people, uh, you know, in Congress are going to sit there and they're going to, you know, I've, I've done my share of lobbying and you realize, wow, if you're not there every week, uh, that you know you kind of fade into the background. The people who have a, a clear economic interest are there, uh, providing advice, providing help, providing insight, shaping the dialogue. And I think part of what we have to get back to in this discussion is uh, how we use this inside-outside uh, dynamic, not just to change the fundraising dynamic, but the conversation about what are the issues and what the people want, and and how uh, Congress understands, uh, you know what the people want. Because right now, uh, I still remember when Jeff Bezos and I went to Washington in 2000 to talk about patent reform, and, and one of the people we met said, well, you... But uh, Bev Selby from the American Small Inventors Association, whatever it is, will be here next week, and the week after, and the week after, and the week after. And, you know, I, I do think that, that, you know, one of the things we have to deal with is the fact that the Internet... Uh, comes together briefly around something like SOPA and PIPA and then you know people go away and we have to figure out how do you build constituencies for ideas that are persistent, that are broad, that are ongoing and that, that cause people in Congress uh, to uh, you know to wake up and I think we also need something of an inside game on those things you know those issues actually need somebody who will go in and will meet with staff and will explain to them why these issues matter and who they matter to Oop, the staying power question. Um, I know there's a lot of people who want to jump in here. Bram, you wanted to bring something up. It might be a little bit different twist, but give, give us your, your thoughts. Uh, yeah, I, a lot of the issue with money in politics is really a, one of having low voter participation, that not that many people vote. Uh, of the people who vote, not all that many of them spend all that much time researching how they're going to vote and discussing with their friends and things like that uh, about what they want to do. And by improving that, we can dilute uh, the impact of uh, propaganda that's put in front of people. And I think what we really need is uh, a mobile app for voting that reminds you when it's time to vote in your local area, like tells you all the things you're going to have to vote on, which we have many of here in California, it shows you the vote, you know, the arguments for and against which you get in your voter pack, helps you plan out which way you're going to vote, share your plans with your friends, and that kind of stuff. And that would really go a long way towards making it so you have a much more uh, part participatory and uh, well-informed uh, voter base. Got you. Brad, you want to jump in too, um, particularly with, with um, relation to, to the other questions? Well, I think uh, Bram's idea is, is, is obviously a, a great idea, and there's a lot of ways in which we can uh, do a better job of integrating, of making voters more potent in the system and, and, and to countering the, the issue of money. But I wanted to really t talk about um, a couple of different things. Uh, Tim said early on in this conversation that, um, it, that the movement really doesn't matter until there are economic interests at stake and the economy begins to shift. 
And I agree, and, and, and I also want to zero in on something that Ben said, which is that the movement's going to be most powerful if it's decentralized and organic and and sort of persistent. Um, and something that that Larry dis, Larry said, which was that the movement. Um, it, you know, the, he described the progressive movement as a series of connected but sort of loosely coupled uh, movements. And I think that's the that's where we're headed. But to bring all of that together, um, think about a number of the innovations at, on the internet that <clears throat> have begun to reshape the economy around the notion of peer-to-peer uh, -peer services. So whether it's uh, in lending, in finance, in housing, Airbnb, in transportation, Uber or Halo, um, or in education, things like Coursera or Skillshare, um, what we're seeing is the emergence of a new kind of economy, a networked economy which um, is frankly fundamentally challenging because it has a much lower price point then uh, it is fundamentally challenging to the incumbents, the incumbents who are, for the most part, um, large you know, bureaucratic hierarchies that provide the same set of services in a more costly way. And those services, because they're so well connected, are working on ways to resist that, the emergence of this new economy. And so you see fights like the fight that Uber had in D.C. or the fight that Airbnb has had in New York or the fight that Coursera had in Minnesota um, where the incumbents are suggesting actually proactive changes sometimes to prevent the emergence of these, these new, new models. Well, the, the technique that has been working is when these networks, which in, by their nature enlist a lot of consumers who gain a lot of benefit from these new services, when those new networks um, reach out to their consumers, as you saw Uber do in D.C., you get a, a, a political reaction that counters the weight of the insider, uh, insider money. And I think it, it becomes sort of um, obvious to the city council in D.C. that this is not going to go quietly um, and that if they favor the existing incumbent taxi industry in a way that disserves the community that they're, that they're actually voted in to serve, um, that there's going to be a reaction. And I, and I think that there may be a way to weave a thread between all of these what appear to be different local contests, whether it's um, you know, education in Minnesota or transportation in D.C., as one theme that is very closely tied to what Larry brought up at the very beginning. Um, and so how do we use that new economic force um, use the connections that they have to their consumers to begin to, um, you know, sort of um, solidify this movement and recruit these users as advocates um, to, to, to actually bring voting pressure uh, uh, from the outside uh, on this existing regime. I love that idea. That's terrific. Uh, hey, Anna, and then June wanted to jump in, and then we'll, we'll keep keep going here. These are all fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think Brad's point is really provocative. Um, I was actually going to sort of take it in a slightly different direction, um, just to say that I think, um, you know, the internet is really helpful in essentially catalyzing and enabling these unprecedented um, before well, maybe not unprecedented, but what feels like in modern times unprecedented uprisings of attention and energy um, and people sort of speaking out. So if you think about, as you know, folks have said, SOPA and PIPA, but also the, the Kony 2012 video um, that really focused attention on a civil war in the middle of Africa um, with all sorts of problems and there was great analysis that flowed around the web about ways in which that uh, organization wasn't quite getting it right, um, but it did serve as a kind of lightning rod of public attention to a huge problem. And I think the question to me, among others, is how do we continue to do that, continue to um, facilitate you know, sweeping attention, both in the sort of national and international context and more locally. Um, you know, if there's an outrage in a, a small town in West Virginia, that deserves to have the same kind of powerful uh, focusing of attention as um, a moment where the internet sort of openness is under siege. Um, but how do you essentially take those moments as organizers, as, as folks who work with technology and who are connected to civic organizations, how do we kind of bottle that outrage and those big um, attentive moments um, and sort of 
funnel them into ongoing social change. You know, an out, a moment of outrage is a great way to focus attention in our, um, uh, in our very distracted society, but that doesn't in itself mean change. Imagine what happened after Newtown, right? There was essentially the entire country focused on the problem of gun violence prevention, but we haven't yet seen um, national legislation to really address the problem. We've seen interesting things on the local level, but um, anyway, the, I think that is the quite one key question to me is how you essentially move from uprising moment of outrage to long-term organizationally grounded, civically grounded, um, you know, as Ben has said in, in other moments, how do you move from a movement, a moment to a movement? What does that look like? How can we help facilitate that? Love the idea. Uh, June, j jump to June. Yeah, so, um, uh, so just building on Anna's point, um, a couple of thoughts there. I think that any, um, either movement that catches on or meme that catches on actually requires a little bit of both, right? You need that, that big flashpoint, that moment, whether that's a, 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 whether that's a viral video or a campaign that, that, that catalyzes a lot of people. And then, and then, as you said, Anne, it's a question of what comes next. And there's, there's two pieces of that, I think. One of that is um, the action piece. How do you get people to take effective action? And I think that is a question that there's so many organizations trying to solve. Right now there are some interesting directions out there, but I think it's going to be one of the key things we see movement on in the next two years. But the other one is actually in some ways kind of the simple direction of capturing those people's both turning somebody from a one-time viewer or a listener or a reader into a subscriber or follower or friend or fan, whichever um, medium, getting them to be part of your long-term um, communication base. And that doesn't actually, to me, just mean having their email address because media habits are changing so quickly people communicate um, differently. So I think for, for any movement or any idea that wants to take hold, it, you have to be working across uh, media, right? You have to have both email addresses. You have to be on, and this is very basic stuff, but people often just forget to forget about it. Um, you know, you have to be on Facebook, you have to be on Google, you have to be on um, Twitter, so that you can you can get into a person's kind of media habit over time. And I think that um, impacts both the way you distribute your essential message, which um, yes, you can just do a YouTube video, but that's only one platform. Not everyone is on um, YouTube. You shouldn't just be thinking video. You should also be thinking text. You should be thinking across different platforms. You should be thinking mobile. And then in terms of subscriber base, you shouldn't just think email, but also about all of the other ways that people receive their news. So on both of those sides, again, I think it's about that flashpoint and then that continued communication and thinking across different media habits and how they're evolving. And Ben, you want to jump on that. Go for it. Uh, yeah, I think a lot of great things have been said on this already. We talk a lot, as Anna referenced, and I think spoke quite well on it, about this idea of taking moments and developing into movements. Um, I think that what's happening right now in a really exciting way is with citizen-driven, individual-driven campaigns that are happening across the web, that you're turning sort of these abstract issues into really personal stories. The, the example that we saw this past year that was most powerful, I thought, uh, on the site was there's a woman, uh, Jennifer Tyrell, who had been a den mother in the Boy Scouts, which for the past hundred years had discriminated against LGBT members, um, and it had been an issue that went all the way to the Supreme Court in 2000. Uh, people had more or less given up on it. There's sort of this idea of kind of national campaigns that hadn't worked all that effectively, and it was the personal narrative of Jennifer Tyrell that sparked a movement really to sort of spread this across the country because it was her that got kicked out of the Boy Scouts. She was a den mother that was quite popular. She got 300,000 people to join her campaign. She delivered it in person uh, in the National Council. It was quite popular in the media, but the reason it was powerful is it didn't stop there. It was actually the most important piece. It was it went from that single individual moment that they catalyze the country and do hundreds of local campaigns, also rooted in many cases in personal stories that sort of build momentum over time, that got companies to pull money out of the Boy Scouts, that got you know, national TV stations to stop covering the Boy Scouts, that got individual sort of troop leaders to come out against the policy. It was that radically distributed nature. And I, I will note that it was facilitated by an organization. That organization wasn't in existence before that movement began. It was actually Scouts for Equality a group that sort of emerged from this emergent behavior uh, that happened in distributed ways. And so I think what's interesting is, in Fight for the Future, others have, have happened out of SOPA and PIPA, where you just, it's not like you have this massive disconnect between traditional organizations and individual atomized people. It's rather that you have, because the individuals can start these sort of, we call them wildfire campaigns, out of that oftentimes organizes a very focused movement that is optimized on a single objective, which in many cases I think is more effective. We look at what you know, analogously has been very powerful in the consumer internet, 
over the past decade. It is platforms that focus on one thing and one thing only and get it really damn well. And like that's I mean, like we're literally a site about petitions, like a petition site. There's like video is YouTube and auctions is eBay, and people that really focus on a single thing. I think we'll see these emergent movements out of moments that are focused on a single objective and really optimize around that vis-a-vis -vis the traditional organizations that tend to be a bit more generic and can be helpful, but oftentimes I don't think will move the sort of game in the same way that individual emergent groups will. So there seems to be some kind of balancing act between how do we actually get some kind of coordination or some kind of um, meta, 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 take it another level from all this that's bubbling up. I don't know, Larry, I just want to check in with you kind of about halfway in to this conversation here. Um, you have any thoughts of what you're hearing here or how you'd like to kind of push it another level or um, any ch just to check in with you in terms of what you're hearing here and how it's kind of working. I, I've, I've been taking copious notes, and I, I'd like to build on what Ben just said, um, because I, I agree the way to make this thing salient is for people to start tying it to a personal narrative. But I wonder whether we can expand the conception of narrative beyond the, you know, beyond the issues that really get people emotionally, like you know, being kicked out from the Boy Scouts because of something ridiculous like your sexual orientation. Um, into something, uh, um, you know, maybe a little less emotional, but really quite important. So the issues that Brad was talking about, um, uh, when you think about, you know, personal narratives, maybe, you know, even narratives about, you know, companies talking about the way in which, you know, here's here are people that use Uber talking about the way in which Uber gets blocked in a particular place. And why is Uber getting blocked in a particular place? You know, um, and this is where you can remix the uh, Clinton, you know, slogan of it's the economy stupid. We should have a slogan here. It's the money stupid. It's the money stupid. That's why these things are getting blocked. And if we could think about the platform as exploding the number of these very short personal narratives that tie to the issue or have a punchline related to the issue, I think that begins to seed the kind of recognition that creates the incentive for politicians to try to to, to try to uh, capitalize on it by actually making this their issue. But I completely agree. It's got to feel non-esoteric. It's got to feel like people understand how it's screwing up or screwing around with something they care about. And, and then when they see it three or four times, they'll eventually connect the dots. And that's the, that's the punch that um, this movement needs. Got you. Um, Anybody want to jump in on that point he just kind of met? Because we are kind of, it's, it's, it, we're, we're about halfway through here, so we're starting to kind of think, okay, where can, what can we start to build on and extract here? But if not, uh, um, so, I, so I, actually, Anna had her hand up, I think. She oh, Anna, go ahead. Sorry, I missed that. Jump right yeah, in. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to say I think this is a great and important thread. And what we've seen so far is that distributed campaigning um, can be incredibly effective and has been demonstrated um, to be incredibly effective against targets that can make their decisions relatively quickly. Um, the Boy Scouts, to, to Ben's example, the Boy Scouts took a long time, but as an institution, they actually are able to make decisions about their own policies more quickly than the US Congress can right now. And I think one of the, um, so there's a question around targets and the complexity of moving um, a governmental target with all the other forces that are acting on it versus a corporate target or um, you know an, another kind of target. And then separately, I wanted to just sort of raise up the fact that that I, I'm totally in agreement that the that personal narratives are vital in our organizing, and that that's really you know the future of organizing. I think is distributed. I think it's um, I think it's a sort of raising up the power of personal story. I think it's emergent. I think it's layering um, you know light national coordination on top of all those things. Um, but we really do have to figure out how personal narratives can play in these abstract. Uh, uh, structural fights. So money in politics, uh, just that phrase, money in politics, that's two abstractions. And we're talking about that as this vital campaign. It does affect millions and millions of people's lives very personally and directly. But one of the challenges we have as organizers is finding ways to pull out those stories as they sort of intersect with these abstractions. Um, I think that the, the movement sort of in the wake of the financial crisis was very powerful in this sense. All the, the work that folks at 
you know, groups like Occupy Homes have been doing, um, they've been essentially taking people's personal stories of hardship and connecting them with the sort of excesses of what we saw on Wall Street. The student loans campaigning that our members are doing right now is all about individual personal stories, how their life has been affected. Um, uh, but then that connects to this broader question of how we as a society value education, how we as a society value what banks do. Um, so I think this, uh, this is an ongoing challenge for all of us to find ways to draw out personal deep stories that can kind of illuminate these abstractions. Terrific, uh, Ben, and then and then and then uh, Tim, go for it. Yeah, I think Anne is absolutely right. I think it's both the case that the future of sort of social movements is rooted in large part in personal narratives, but it is a challenge in some issues. I will say that we've seen one of the most powerful narratives. It's not just how the issues are impacting real people's lives. It's the authenticity, and the unimpeachability of the creator themselves. And the most powerful that we've seen over the past years are teenage girls starting campaigns and literally changing laws. Um, there's a very sort of well-known campaign around plastic bags in Illinois, and it's a very local campaign. It literally became a 13-year-old girl, Abby Goldberg, versus the plastics industry in Illinois that passed a law because of special interests to make it illegal to pass taxes on local plastic bags. Right? Ridiculous law exclusively because of special interests. She petitions the governor of her state, gets 100,000 people to join. She gets all this massive media exposure and the governor calls her on her home phone line, says, I've been inspired by her campaign, I'm gonna veto the bill that nobody cared about at all. And it wasn't that she was uniquely personally impacted by plastic bags, it was just the incredible authenticity. This is where, you know, Larry talked about in the beginning, sort of the cross-partisan, really apolitical, in this case, story. And when you are a big, bad industry, arguing against an 11 year old girl like you've already lost right and you sort of have this dynamic now where in, in situations where the emperor has no clothes where it's clearly conspicuously against the public interest but it's so common that it's hard to point out if someone who's younger oftentimes is able to call out that which everyone knows but no one talks about in a way that's difficult to contest because both it's true and because of their character right, is unimpeachable it's just a, a kid who clearly sees the reality of the situation I think that that type of dynamic is really powerful, and we've seen this win in many different corporate and political campaigns, especially in local contexts. I wanted to throw in another point there. Uh, the authenticity is super important, but there was another aspect of that story, which is that it's local. You know, uh, one of the things that it's easy to forget in politics is that it is a local game, even you know at the at the federal level. You know, I've heard talking with uh, people in Congress, they say, look, we don't want to hear from people who aren't our constituents. You know, maybe they care in the broadest way, but uh, I remember talking with a bunch of social media uh, people, and they're saying, look, we can't use social media because we don't know whether those people are from our district. And that concept, I think, is really important. And I, I do think, increasingly, we need to figure out how to have a movement that's broad and deep enough that we end up with a lot of local people with local stories, uh, you know, a passionate kid who's from your state or from your district is going to have a way bigger impact than a, you know, a passionate kid from a blue state if you're in a red state or a passionate kid from a red state if you're in a blue state, you know, and, and I do think we have some interesting technology to become more uh, uh, locally aware. Uh, you know, we, I, we need to map you know, Facebook to congressional districts, for example. Yeah, Tim. Tim makes a. Uh, it's a. It's a hundred percent right. Local is obviously um, critical in influencing politics at the legislative level. Legislative level. Uh, there's a couple of a, um, exceptions to that. I just want to point those out. One of them is the the politician who's looking for the promotion, the Marco Rubio or the Andrew Como. Uh, you are able to influence them um, from a national perspective. And you're seeing that with Marco Rubio right now, trying to thread the needle on the immigration stuff, which obviously, given the demographics of Florida, is right up his bailiwick, but then he also wants to be president, and to do that he needs to get through a Republican primary, so therefore he has to uh, try to diffuse the anger on the right on that issue. So that's one example. The other one, though, is, is actually, to me, more, more interesting uh, in the context of, of building these mass movements, and that's the politician who was empowered by having a national movement behind him or her. And to me, uh, on the Democratic side, Elizabeth Warren is a, is a fantastic example. Bernie Sanders in Vermont is another fantastic example of people who 
yeah, they're, they're focused on local issues, but their national base and, and, and the ability to rally people nationally are very critical to their ability to have an impact in, uh, in their chamber. On the Republican side, Jim DeMint was an example. Uh, on the Republican side, uh, uh, people like Steve King, Michelle Bachman, uh, these are people who actually are able to parlay national uh, support into a much more prominent role in their legislative bodies than their otherwise their profile would indicate. Because Michelle Bachman would be a, a uh, just a random congressperson, one of 435 from a suburban district in Minnesota. Who cares? Well, people care because of that national movement. So I don't want to discount the national stuff entirely, but obviously Tim is right. In, in the vast majority of cases, the ability for us to impact locally is going to be critical in, in moving legislation against these big interests. June, do you want to jump in? Yeah, so um, two perspectives that I can share here, building on a few previous points. The first one was the one about personal narratives, which I, I agree, or I, th I think we've probably all found this in our work there probably the most powerful way to spread an idea and you know over the years we've really thought a lot to ourselves about sort of what what has what has made what have made TED Talk succeed right they're tape lectures they really shouldn't have been by any reason watched this many times online and I've really come to believe that one of the most powerful reasons that they've spread is that they are all based on a personal narrative not just a personal narrative but a person telling their own story in in video form and if you think about it in many ways this is the medium that we um, evolved to take in sort of authentic old-fashioned human storytelling a person telling you their story locking eyes with you and I think that's actually part of the power of what's driven TED Talks and I think that's a, just an important um, aspect to think about when you're thinking about how to bring a personal narrative forward because there's many ways to do that you could do it in a documentary form you could do it in a written form but I actually think having a person tell their own story has just a unique impact on us not just intellectually but um, emotionally and you need that emotional connection to really uh, change people's minds and to move them. The other note I just wanted to make was one on um, Larry that I think about a lot for you on this issue which is the challenge of bipartisanship. So and we again we think about this a, a lot at TED. We are um, decidedly nonpartisan. It's part of our um, uh, mission. Uh, you know many of you know we have uh, we allow people to hold TEDx events around the world. These sort of independently held TEDx events. It's part of the guidelines for every TEDx organizer that their event has to be um, nonpartisan. They can't use sort of partisan us versus them language in a talk. That doesn't come naturally to a lot of people. Um, but it's it's been really important for us, and it's always and it's a constant challenge for us because um, I'd say overall, probably if you looked at our audience base, it probably does skew more um, progressive. If, honestly, if you look at our staff, it skews more progressive. But to really move ideas forward, we believe it's it's absolutely essential to have that big tent that Tim was talking about earlier. And I think that's going to be a really interesting challenge for you. I mean, in truth, even looking at our group of advisors on this panel now, we're very we skew quite progressive. And I think um, a combination just my quick thoughts for you on it are both uh, making sure that you're, of course, bringing to the table strong voices on the right, and also encouraging um, all those who kind of join the movement to sort of resist the urge to, or resist the temptation um, to shift into par uh, partisan language. You know, it's very easy to be sort of not necessarily emotional about it, but to, when making the point about this particular issue, about how money influences politics, to use examples that are specifically partisan or, or point fingers in a partisan way. And there's nothing wrong with that in, in many environments, but I think, I think uh, as you laid out, that's one of your most important points, and that is probably something you're going to need to find a way to articulate um, at both the highest level and allow that to trickle down. But I, I, I do feel it's going to be an interesting challenge for you. Yeah, can I just add, uh, pick up on that for a second? Um, I, I completely agree with both points. I, I think actually what Brad was saying before helps us frame this in a way that's very amenable to people on the right, or at least sensible people on the right. You know, they talk about crony capitalism. What they're talking about is exactly what Brad's talking about. And, and you know, credible people like um, Luigi Zingales, who's this libertarian economist from the University of Chicago, has written this fantastic book called Saving Capitalism from the Capitalists. And his basic point is that capitalists, when they come into power, get there because they've had an open competitive field, but then use their power to protect themselves from the next generation of competitors. So people who are credible on the right, who believe in the market, should very much care about exactly these issues because of the way it, it screws up the market. And that links directly to your second point. I mean, I have enormous respect for a huge uh, number of people in this movement have been pushing um, you know, to try to get people involved. And there's been a very big successful campaign around Citizens United that has brought two million people into 
into this issue, and Move On has been a big part, and Daily Kos has been, been a big part of that too. But I, I sometime hesit, sometimes I'm a little bit anxious about that movement because of the way it frames the issue to make it sound like this is all about being against corporations. Now, you know, I, I think Citizens United was wrong. I, I don't think um, the way it's been interpreted uh, is required by the Constitution. But I think the fundamental point is if you talk about this movement in a way that makes it sound like you want to end free market capitalism, um, you know, we'll get 20 or 30 or 40 percent of America to get really excited about it. Um, but I fear that we turn off the 30 or 40 percent of America who we need to win. You know, fundamentally, you don't get fundamental change unless you have 30, uh, unless you have 70 percent of America behind you. Um, uh, you know, we can win partisan victories, of course, but this is not a partisan victory. This is a fundamental victory. So I completely agree. We have to, as you say, resist the urge to frame this in a way that's just exciting to our own people. Uh, we have to talk about this in a way that the other side can hear. And that's why I think focusing on corruption or crony capitalism you know, actually gives us that opportunity. Anna, you want to jump in about that, but also I'd encourage uh, Brad. Uh, Larry has a couple times come up with your idea, so it would be good to elaborate a little bit more on what you were thinking in that space too. But Anna, jump in on your... Um, and your bipartisan thread. Oh, sure. So, just um, there's an interesting uh, there's an interesting through line here. I think about the importance of finding ways to tackle money in politics in a way which is bipartisan or transpartisan or nonpartisan. And I think um, I think you know I, I actually want to both make the point that partisanship can be okay. Like there are times when fightiness fightiness is very authentic for where people are coming from and how they feel and that's actually great and important and useful in the democratic process small d democratic um, but that said I totally hear the thread I think it's right on that there is an opening here for transpartisan work to counter the corrosive influence of big money in our politics at the national level and all the way on down to the local level um, I, I wanted to share quickly that Joan Blades, who's a, the very thoughtful, one of the very thoughtful co-founders of Move On, has been meeting with Mark Meckler, who's one of the founders of the Tea Party Patriots, and they've been engaging in conversations, looking for common ground, and their common uh, uh, frustrations with crony capitalism is one of those places where they do agree. Um, I actually would also note that I don't think that Move on is at the same place on the spectrum on the left as the Tea Party is on the right. I think there are actually democratic socialists and all sorts of other folks that should be represented in that conversation. But still, it's an interesting uh, illustration, I think, of how um, political ideology doesn't break down neatly around the problems of big money in our politics. Um, <clears throat> I think that's that's a very interesting point that it does not break down neatly. Um, and I wonder if, uh, I, I mean, I think that the, the, the libertarian right and the, um, uh, and sort of the, the economic realists on the left, I mean, that's not the right way to put it. I don't have the right category there. there there's a very strong relationship. And what, what I wonder is if we're just to talk of partisanship assumes the existing parties and the existing party platforms. And what, what I think is really happening is we're seeing the emergence of a new center. Um, and I think that new center is in many ways defined by the values of the internet, which have to do with being free, open, frankly commercial, frankly capitalist, uh, but inherently sort of a new kind of capitalism. I mean, the P2P sharing stuff is actually resembles in many ways uh, socialism more than it does capitalism, but it is a form of capitalism and it, it is being implemented through capitalism. And so my question is, is there a new center and is there going to be a possibility and is one of the mechanisms that we need to drive money out of politics recognizing that the existing parties, one or the other of them, is going to move to the center first um, and the one that does, I mean, we kind of saw this with Bill Clinton moving somewhat to the right and, and capturing, you know, a, a, a big, bot, big part of the electorate. Um, is one or the other party going to move to the center first, perhaps the, the right giving up the, you know, relatively restrictive social issues or the, or the left giving up um, support for existing incumbent institutions that are actually part of crony capitalism, like unions or, 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 or you know, something like that, and, 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 and moving to the center, um, defining a, a new political movement, and then what, you know, that party forming the base that we need to affect the change that we're trying to affect. 
Nobody gotcha. wants to answer that. No, one. no, Bram, <laughs> it's a tough one. Well, let's. Well, that well, Bram was going to jump in here. Jan, Bram, go uh, for yeah, it. the um, uh, it's it's nice to talk about bipartisanship. That's sort of a warm feeling term. Uh, but the fact is that individual voters are partisan. They have opinions. They have a place that they're coming to, uh, that they're coming from. Uh, and in the end, in politics, there are issues being decided on. Go uh, governments make laws. They make things happen. And people are, in the end, uh, being partisan about what they want to have happen there. Uh, and when it comes to appealing to voters and increasing voter participation, it's very, very important uh, to figure out who's going to be interested in what and approach them about their own particular issues that they're interested in uh, either for or against uh, and come to them from where they're coming from. And we were talking before about going from uh, moments to movements. And I think it's very, very important when someone gets involved in a particular uh, moment that you get the engagement with them that you can, which is mostly email addresses these days, but could also be... Um, uh, uh, mobile installs, and unfortunately Twitter and Facebook don't really work well for this because of the local thing that Tim was talking about. Uh, and figure out what it is that they're interested in, and then communicate with them in a way in the future which uh, pulls them into things that they're interested in, which they don't perceive as spammy and then opt out of in the end, which actually gets them involved in an ongoing way. But Bram, do you think that that people are partisan in the sense that they uh, that they completely identify with one party or another, or that that rather they have a set of issues and they agree with some of the things that, I mean, one of the most interesting things that's happened to me recently is talking to really right-wing Republicans about government surveillance and finding how appalled they are by this and finding the common ground with the ACLU for the first time, you know. And so it feels to me like people are actually feeling less comfortable with simply identifying with a party and they have a more complicated relationship with the party which means that they're they could be separated from the party and and organized around a different set of principles uh, yeah yeah certainly the two party system is mostly just an artifact of the way we conduct elections <laughs> in the united states which basically which is part of the corruption that, that larry's talking about here yeah uh, yeah, and in San Francisco, we actually have ranked ballots now instead of uh, first past to the post for uh, electing the mayor, which I think is a very good thing. Yeah, but I, yeah. but I think, you know, Bram's pointing to a really, you know, what I think of as one of the most important problems or challenges here, which is that the business model of organizing turns out to be very partisan. Um, you know, I was watching Chris Murphy, who is the youngest senator, um, you know, just, just elected from Connecticut, talk about um, the, re the difference in the return to fundraising between emails that they send out attacking Democrats and emails they send out, I mean, attacking Republicans and emails they send out just praising what they've been doing. And, uh, and it's a difference of three to one. So you, you, you can see how people inside of a movement or inside of an organization have a very strong desire to scream loudly about how great we are on our side and how terrible they are on their, their side. Um, so that, that's the first part of the problem. The second point, the second part is to say, I completely, you know, I want to emphasize again, I don't think we can gloss over those differences. We can't pretend that, we, that they don't exist there. There are really important values to fight about, and we need partisan fights around those, va those values. The question I have is, is there a way to bring people maybe one step up from that? Um, where they can, you know, people can come to a recognition about how, um, you know, we have these disagreements, but we also have a more fundamental agreement. And I think things Brad were pointing to about, you know, the security, the the the, um, the issues around the NSA right now, are are moments where people have that recognition. Like, look, I I, I have a more fundamental value around the importance of privacy than my values around being a Republican or uh, being a Democrat. After all, it's a Democrat in the White House right now. Um, uh, and and so I'm I guess I'm asking a question whether we can have that same kind of recognition, but tied to the, the incredibly important value of, of, re of recreating a republic or a democracy that can work. Now it shouldn't be too hard. It's not like that's a controversial idea that we ought to have a, a government that works. But I am still challenged about how do we get the mobilization um, that's necessary to produce that. Well, Larry, let me um, just uh, quickly say. Uh, the problem isn't partisanship. 
uh, down the list, the American people are actually more unified on, on many issues than Washington, D.C. would indicate. I mean, 90% plus of people agree on background checks for uh, gun buyers. How did that not make it through, I'd see, because of the... Uh, because of the effect of, of the gun lobby money in Washington, D.C. This is sort of the core pro, you know, uh, pro, uh, problem that we're supposed to be talking about, is money and politics. It distorts D.C. It does not distort the partisan uh, makeup of the country. vast majority of Americans, about 80 percent, believe in comprehensive immigration reform. It is not a controversial topic in the rest of the United States, but somehow it is in Washington, D.C. Go down the issue, uh, Social Security, uh, Medicare, vast majority of American people, including Republicans and Independents and Democrats, agree on these issues. So the problem isn't that Americans are too partisan. The problem is that Washington, D.C. is too partisan. Why is that? And I believe it's the core problem that we're supposed to be talking about. It's because of the money that is distorting the politics of Washington, D.C. And that's that nothing to do with the American people. So if the American people dictated policy in Washington, D.C., I think we'd have a much different uh, outcome in a lot of these legislative uh, discussions and battles. Yeah, I, com I, I completely agree with that point. I wish you'd convince Ezra Klein of that point because I'm so tired of reading about how, no, the problem is partisanship, it's not money. And no, you know, without the recognition, it's the money that's driving the partisanship. Um, but I do think we have to be, you know, we have to recognize that, you know, though we might agree on a lot of issues, there are real disagreements. There are real uh, worldview disagreements in America. Um, you know, the, there's great work by, done by Dan Gahan of the cultural cognition, which shows that the very same description of the facts um, by a certain kind of person will be radically differently understood depending upon the cultural perspective of the people who's actually hearing it. And, and we need to take that into account. There's not going to be, you know, a single, you know, certainly not going to be a, a law professor who stands up and is going to be heard in a responsive way by the vast range of Americans. We have to find a way to build a movement that has, you know, people in their tribe talking to people in their tribe um, and, and getting them to a place where they have to get, recognize, you don't have to give up the tribal association, the recognition, in order to see that we have a more fundamental tribe we have to try to find a way to feed. Actually, this is, um, this is I mean, a fantastic conversation, a lot of great ideas. Um, unfortunately, for this roundtable, we're, get, we're coming up on about 15 minutes left. Um, and one of the ways just, to, I mean, it's something that we can't solve in 90 minutes, although I'd honestly love to do more of these. Um, but I think it actually does start to, as everyone's got it, we, we would like to hear from everybody. And, and I guess what Larry kind of teed up there, uh, we should be thinking about. I mean, my sense is, you know, one of the things we could go around the table is, you know, what are, what are you kind of learning or seeing or what's your big takeaway from, from this, from this roundtable? But also kind of what, what would come next or what's something that we should be looking towards it's a it's a hard kind of stretcher but or at the very least kind of a last kind of point that you'd like to make out of this discussion clearly there's room for many more and clearly uh, we should at some point I would love to find ways to do that but, but given the time and given uh, the 90 minutes we got here to work with um, why don't we go around the table and then obviously we'll end with with um, with, with uh, Larry uh, and you can just jump on also Larry's last point there if you want to uh, does anyone want to just uh, kind of go first here a little bit on, on what they're, what's emerging here and, and what you're seeing as the threads and, and where you, what, what we might want to look at next. Meaning, in the future, what's some next steps coming off this? Any thoughts on that? I'm not sure that I can pull it all together as you assigned <laughs> us to do there, uh, Peter, but I, I will make one point, and that is that, um, it, and it's a point that I'm not going to claim credit for. It came out of a conversation that uh, Larry and I think Tim were both a part of uh, a long, no, a year and a half ago, I guess, um, and in thinking about this problem. And um, the, the observation was that to, to understand the importance of money in politics, you have to understand how the money is being used. And today the money is being used primarily to buy 30-second spots in local markets. And by the way, it's, it's, a very, it's one of the reasons that television companies are being bought and sold right now is because of the anticipated spending that we are going to do. So there's, you know, there's a lot of vested interest in those 30-second spots. And the reason they're buying the 30-second spots is that they work um, and that they sway voters. Um, and the question is, can we undermine the value of those 30-second spots? Um, instead of trying to get money out of politics, would, it, would, it, would there be some way to limit the effect of money in politics by limiting the effect of those 30-second spots? 
Well, that's going to happen naturally as the generation that doesn't have a landline and doesn't have a cable subscription sort of comes of age and becomes a more important political force. They are actually more influenced by social media than they are by the 30-second spot. So we have that wind at our back. Um, and the question is, is there some way that we can accelerate that? Um, and one of the interesting characteristics of social media advertising is that it's driven by friends of friends. And so, you know, Larry's proposal to give everyone a voucher and allow them to spend that voucher the way they want, in a way, everyone already has a voucher. Because if, if the generation that's coming of age and that's going to define American politics for the next 20 years is paying more attention to Facebook than they are to CBS, then the, your, the way you communicate on Facebook actually will have a, a political impact. And so um, the question is, could we do something like have um, some of these new incumbents, Facebook, Twitter, Google, um, promote um, a, a kind of social media advertising by, for instance, offering to, um, to you know, to increase the value of your own opinion by giving you essentially a voucher within your social media sphere to allow you what would be essentially social media advertising inventory to promote your own views. Um, and it's just another way of thinking about um, shifting, the, shifting the way influence is, is created in Washington. Love that idea. Um... Who wants, anyone want to jump in? How about Ben? Ben, do you want to kind of give your thoughts as you wrap up here and think ahead? Yeah, sure. By the way, I think that is an outstanding point. Uh, it's been mentioned a couple times here as well that effectively the reason that politicians care about money is because it actually gets them the kind of attention that influences people that end up going to or voting for them at the polls. Um, and insofar as you can influence people independent of money, you have a different channel of influence. So I think that is actually absolutely the way the world is going. I think stepping back, um, I, I mentioned at the beginning, I think that historically, social movements have been extremely difficult to organize, right? extremely difficult in time and in resources, and it's because of that that has limited the number of social movements that can be born, and it's because of that that the ones that have, over the past couple decades, have been centralized and often very political and impersonal. And I think what's happened now is technology has radically reduced the costs of collective action, of organizing, and by virtue of that, you have this really distributed, very personal incremental local campaigns that open up avenues for new types of organizing that weren't previously possible. And issues that were inaccessible, it seemed like there was an impasse like money and politics. I really think there is a new opportunity for using that organizing model in a decentralized way to disrupt traditional sources of power. I think that if you had thousands of campaigns around the country with individual citizens asking city councils or school boards or individual donors and committing large donors to not contribute money to any politician not committed to changing the influence of money in politics, to state representatives, to assemblies, you end up getting this massive groundswell of support winning incremental campaigns every single week all across the country. And that momentum is important just for building a longer term sort of narrative, but actually for aggregating interest and influence and media attention because of all these different victories. And we've seen this happen small amounts over the past couple of years, but at an accelerating rate. So I think that in many ways is how many issues will be won. And I think this is maybe one of the most important that will use this as a demonstration model to actually leverage distributed organizing to win very broad change that previously wasn't possible because of technology's radical disruption. We're very excited to see that. Terrific. Thanks. Uh, how about Anna? Anna, do you want to give us summing, your summing? Um, sorry, uh, mic issues. So yeah, I think um, I'm still thinking about Larry's challenge of um, how we can mobilize enough people to be strong enough to force change in Washington on this complicated, big, endemic, pervasive problem. Um, and I think um, I'm, I'm intrigued and gratified to hear so many of us thinking in some similar directions about pushing power out looking for distributed organizing, emergent organizing to sort of fuel a broader mass mobilization. I think those insights are all right. It's certainly where, you know, as Move On has been um, pushing this year towards figuring out how to really power our members' campaigns. Um, and I think that will, that is one key way that we can grow the progressive movement, the sort of movement of people who care about um, democracy to be big enough and strong enough to force change in Washington as well as in state capitals and in local places as well. So 
um, you know, I wanted to sort of give an example of what I think one of the early examples for us that illustrates what that kind of distributed but coordinated campaigning can look like. So um, climate change is not a uh, uh, divorced from money in politics, the power of big oil companies and gas companies is a real factor in preventing us from taking real action to address climate change. Um, but it's its own thing too. It's it's connected to money in politics, but it's also its own ball of wax. Um, our members are um, organizing um, uh, 250 house parties this weekend around the country um, to screen a new documentary about fracking. Fracking is, you know, uh, people have different opinions about it, but ultimately it is not a um, clean energy, uh, so it's not sort of uh, central to our clean energy future, I would argue, our members would argue. And what you're seeing there is hundreds of local campaigns that are locally focused, that have local targets, that have local creativity and messaging and local leadership on an issue that has this common national umbrella, this common national drive. Um, and I think that as we think about money and politics, that needs to be the kind of, that should be an informative framework for us to think about. How do you genuinely empower that local leadership, genuinely find those creative emergent ideas, but also sort of bundle them together so that they're greater than the sum of their parts. Um, and then I think, um, you know, I'm just, I'm really excited to see how we all figure this out together. And I think that uh, this has been a great conversation. Thanks so much for, for convening it, Peter. Tim, do you want to jump in? Thanks. Uh, fantastic. Sure. I think my uh, biggest uh, takeaway is this, uh, you know, I, I talked in the beginning about this notion of the big tent. And the, the notion of transpartisan issues, I think, is really important here. And I think all of us who are activists need to think harder about how to bring people who we think we disagree with into our movements. And uh, reaching out, uh, you know, in, in various interesting ways to change the framing of the issues. Because I do think we, we get caught uh, very much in, you know, the standard right-left dialogue. And if we want to get back to Larry's inside-outside, we have to figure out what common ground we have uh, with everyone else. And uh, I guess the other key points that I you know, still stick with is I think uh, when people understand that the, the, the world that we want to live in will actually be better when money is out of politics, that it's not just a moral issue, that it's actually uh, hey, we're going to like the future better if it works this way, uh, I think is a really important issue. Terrific. I love that idea. Um, Marcos, you want to jump in? Sure. You know, the, the point about the television advertising was so good, I wish we actually would have led with that because that's kind of the entire point of money in politics is they, they see that as a way to reach voters. And ironically, the less effective television advertising becomes, the more money they need because they need to run more ads that have to, to have the same impact that they used to have with fewer. So actually the fact that people are DVRing and time shifting and, and cutting the cord makes it more, that makes the uh, rush for money more desperate than it ever was before. So, but, uh, so we're moving towards a world I think that eventually uh, it, it's, it's just not sustainable anymore. People aren't going to be swayed by that. Uh, to me, technology obviously is, is a big solution. I mean, the soap of people fight is a perfect example. I mean, how many millions of dollars did the traditional players spend lobbying for that legislation only to see it crash and, and, and fall down on the basis of a basically near free social media uh, online outrage? So the fact is we, we have sort of the, the beginnings of the ability to push back against that big money machine. Uh, the fact that society is moving away from television the traditional television model, the fact that technology is improving, uh, I think all points to ways that we can move forward. And, and I know I, I, I was seeing people asking what, what could they do to combat this. A part of this is, is people need to be engaged on the leadership front. Is they need to start uh, using the tools they have, whether it's Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, whatever, it doesn't matter. Use those tools to start organizing, bring people together, do the things like you know, we were talking about the, the Boy Scouts using change.org to, to create that petition that allowed this movement that eventually changed Boy Scouts. Uh, action. people can do this. I mean, I don't know if people realize the, the power they have, but they do have that power, and to utilize that. And over time, as this becomes more of a norm, I think it's going to be more and more difficult for the old guard, the establishment guard, to fight these big money battles when they're being overrun by a bunch of barbarians with a sticks and stones. So that is a future, that's the optimist in me speaking, but I really think that's the direction we're heading. 
Love that optimism. Uh, June, you want to jump in with your last thoughts? Sorry, microphone. Yeah, you know, so throughout the conversation, the two, the two things I kept thinking about throughout the conversation were, of course, the, the, the nonpartisan uh, challenge or the transpartisan challenge, which I think we've covered well, and also the storytelling challenge. And Larry, it's fun because you're, of course, the, the perfect person to bring this forward. Um, I agree very much with what we've talked about earlier about the importance of personal narrative. Also, online video, and of course, what you're the great champion of is that releasing everything in this great open way, creative com and or creative commons, so that it can be shared. But I think in thinking about your challenge going forward, the things on my thing on my mind um, that I haven't brought up yet is is building off of several of the points, including Anna's, about just the um, the importance of mobilization of this sort of bottom up grassroots mobilization and how you can harness that. And just wanted to share a quick perspective um, from our side here at TED. You know, we have these two very large open volunteer communities, our TEDx community who organized local TED events and our, uh, there have been around 6,000 to date, and our translator community who uh, translate uh, TED Talks into other languages and around 100 different languages. And both of those communities have grown really quickly and there were a couple of just like key principles I think behind that, that um, although they are, they are addressing very different, um, they're working in very different arenas than this, I think really um, apply here. Um, the first is to give like give people something really specific to do. I think oftentimes we we think open and we think well we have to let people do anything uh, to help. We should be open to anyone who wants to contribute in any way but it's enormously useful actually to be super specific and say this is the way and, and not that you can't be open but we found that for scaling being really specific about the specific ways that people can contribute is really useful even if you leave, you have to leave a number of people out. Um, uh, so for us, that's the events and translations. Having really clear guidelines, and I think um, on this part, having an aspect of that being the nonpartisan spirit is uh, super important. Um, and then another one being ways um, of crediting people for their contribution. So we always try to make all of our contributors, TEDx organizers, translators, rock stars, the same way we try to make our speakers rock stars. And people don't contribute for the recognition, but it's important to them that they get it. They contribute for other reasons, to be part of something larger than themselves, but we found that um, having that kind of credit and um, recognition is really important and some sort of rewards built in. But again, those rewards are often, uh, it's, it's not, it's not uh, money in this case. It is usually the kind of recognition feeling um, that they're part of a team and that they're recognized for it. So I just wanted to share a few of those learnings on, on our end as we're wrapping up and thinking about how you drive it forward from here. Excellent principles. Uh, Bram, you want to wind it up and then we'll go to Larry for the final. Oops, you're muted. Yeah, I'm really noticing how we're all talking about how to mobilize and organize and things like that. And some amount of doing a small money fundraising, but really the era of uh, trying to promote democracy by getting a government funding of political campaigns to try and even the playing field, I think is really over. That's not the way things are going to be going forward. And I, I'm not as optimistic as uh, Marcos uh, about money in the future because I think there are a number of very, very successful AstroTurf campaigns that have happened in the last uh, number of years. Um, uh, but definitely... Um, it's going to be moving towards uh, organizing versus money as opposed to how do we get uh, more money to balance things out everywhere. Terrific. And Larry, so we end up with you. It's been a fantastic uh, session here, but uh, what, what are your thoughts as you kind of close out and think about this? Oops, you're, you're, you're muted. Um. It's been incredible. I'm grateful to everybody. Let me just pick up with Bram um, uh, at the end. You know, if you're right, then we've lost. Um, because, uh, you know, I don't think, given how much money is at stake, if we don't find a way to displace the significance of large money, we're not going to find a way to build from the bottom up to, uh, to beat it. Uh, and part of that is related to a, a point I wanted to make in response to Ben. Um, uh, and Brad, um, I love the idea of finding ways to get social media advertising to be significant, to find ways to have influence that's other than money significant. 
But, you know, a lot of the reason for apathy that people have is completely rational. If you don't believe that your government is listening to you because you're not big money, why waste your time engaging in the government? Um, so even if, even if it's trivially easy, you know, there's lots of trivially easy things that you could be doing, and most of those things you'll probably be doing because you don't think there's any payoff, any efficacy for your engagement in politics. So there's a fundamental skepticism about the political process that comes from this perception that we've got um, the big money that's controlling the results. And until we can credibly address that perception, um, I fear that we're going to we're not going to we're not going to get to the the kind of uh, politics we have to have to solve the problems on the right and the left that we need to solve. Now, so what is the mechanism? I mean, um, you know, I, I've been informed by a lot of what's been said here, um, and I think part of what um, has been said here is a recognition of the the limits in 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 building this. You know, it, you know, not even the aspiration because of these limits in building this massive single campaign, um, but you know, maybe one way to think about facing the reality that people organize and get excited from their own perspective is to, is to recognize that we actually don't need people to be speaking to everybody in the world at the same time. It's completely okay for people on the right to, to get rallied up about um, the issue from their perspective and people on the left getting rallied up on the issue from their perspective. Uh, but, but then to think about you know, where's the therapist in chief here? Not the, you know, more like Eisenhower in World War II, somebody who could take radically different um, people, you know, from Stalin to FDR and think about how do we move them all in the common direction against the common enemy? Um, and, that, and that, I think, um, doesn't require necessarily changing the very nature of how these things get organized, but it does require a different kind of recognition of the more fundamental point that's at stake. Um, and then, um, uh, and then coming back to, to June's point, um, you know, in thinking about what's the way to talk about this and beginning to articulate norms that help people talk about this in the most constructive way, you know, one 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 amazing success we haven't touched on, but I think is relevant here, is to think about Wikipedia, which you know, if you if you listen to Jimmy talk about Wikipedia, the thing that's most important to him is not so much you know the internet or the technology that gave everybody access to simple ways to edit web pages but was a set of norms that were built at the core of Wikipedia, norms about um, a neutral point of view and how it's important to address uh, issues respecting those norms. Now, those aren't the appropriate norms for this movement, but I do think that there's, a, there's another set of norms for the way that you engage people respectfully um, in this movement to, 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 to get them to join um, and, and to bring, about, you know, bring their own following with you. Um, to get to get to the objective, um, you know, and and you know to go back to the skepticism um, that Bram that Bram started with. No doubt, it's insanely difficult to imagine winning this. This democracy has never, since the Civil War, faced a challenge like this, and we're not going to address it in the way the Civil War challenged it. So I don't minimize the I don't minimize the the difficulty of it. Um, I just want to emphasize the importance of solving it. Uh, um, because um, we just don't have the option as a nation or for the world, we don't have the option of ignoring the issues that our government now ignores. Um, we export bad policy to the rest of the world by our inaction from climate change to financial reform, um, and we destroy the opportunities for our kids by not addressing these fundamental issues. I can't think, I think most of us here recognize of a more critical thing for us to find a way to solve than and I'm grateful, um, you know, this has been enormously productive in, in helping me think at least, and I hope many, many others that have been watching to think about how we can take the next step. So, Peter, again, I'm grateful you did this, and everybody who's joined this, this talk, this has been fantastically valuable. Couldn't agree more, and I couldn't end it any better. Um, and we've gone a little bit over time, but I will say this uh, for those who are watching, and, uh, you know, we're going to have this, this, you can always get this full video. We're going to do short trailer video of it, like about two to four minutes. Uh, we'll also do individual videos. I'll be right up to this. They'll be the best of social media. Use as an asset. Help spread the word. This is a hugely important problem, and we hope to keep addressing it in the future. And I'd love to see all of you come back at some point, but uh, thank you so much for taking the time here to really, uh, really pull our brain power together and, and push this ball ahead. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate Thanks. it. Thanks, guys. Thank Bye. you. Bye.